looking at Luke chapter 16. How many are ready for kids to go back to school? <laughs> That's a different question. Luke 16, it should be on the screen if you want to follow along. For those of you that think this is familiar, this is what we read last week. Let's stand together as we honor God's word. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides all this, between us... And you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The rich man said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we've already heard from you this morning in Sunday school classes and songs opening prayer, scripture. We pray right now that you will bring our hearts and minds into obedience to your will to hear what you have to say again. Speak, Lord, for your servants hear you. We want to hear you today. We want to be better. We want to draw closer So, honor your word today and honor our relationship with you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. May we see it. Last Sunday, I felt led to emphasize the existence and the reality of hell. And that we must take steps in order to escape hell and go to heaven. If you missed that, uh, I was told somebody had listened to it this week, so it's, it's on, available at the website. I don't want to downplay that at all, but this Sunday I feel led to emphasize the real point of Jesus' parable. Besides just teaching us on heaven and hell, uh, that's his, the afterlife was not his main point here, so another sermon was needed to share that with you today. What was the main point of the parable, as I understand it? I believe that in this parable, Jesus is making two sharp contrasts in order to teach a major truth. So we're going to look at those. Number one, the contrast during life. You can make notes on the back of your bulletin if you like. Not just the main points, but you can fill in other ideas along the margins, etc. The contrast during life. The first sharp contrast in this story was that the rich man lived in luxury while Lazarus lived in poverty. Now, it may be hard for us to understand how this was an acceptable practice in the Jewish society, how one person could live so affluent 
and somebody else could live so poorly. They were the Jews. They were God's chosen people. Certainly, they were supposed to take care of each other. And yes, the Old Testament law pretty much emphasized the taking care of others that were less fortunate. It may be also hard to understand today how we could have this disparity when in most areas of modern culture, if a person is willing to work hard and get an education up to a certain point, at least for their skills, and uh, take opportunity by taking next necessary sacrifices, most people can build a little bit and improve themselves as far as wealth is concerned. If you have some energy to put into it, you put some time into it, and uh, sacrifice a few things, and focus in on on that, in most of modern society today, people can get ahead if they really want to. So it's hard for us to understand this disparity because we've known of many who have improved. Many of you have improved from where you started to where you are today. But the Jewish society in Jesus' day was a class system society, just as others. Uh, cultures are that way, but their particular culture may be a little different than some of the others. You hear about the caste society in, in some cultures, but they had at least four different groups. There was the ruling elite. They were a small percentage, very small percentage of the population. They had privilege and power because of political and family connections. It wasn't always the work that they did, it's the fact of where you were born. Then you had the working class. It was a larger group than the elite. They mostly served the elite through their jobs. So there was a trickle-down effect of wealth because if you were in the homes and doing things for the elite, then some of their little gestures and niceties and cast-off clothes and whatever else may fall to you. And so there was this effect of wealth trickling down from the rich to the second class. This group would include the tax collectors, the merchants, the government suppliers, the privileged priestly class, those that were in the, in the community doing things that were very important. The lower end of this working class would have been the shopkeepers and artisans who, who made and sold products which gave them a regular income because people are always needing something from the bakery or something from the, uh, the person who works with iron or something from the coppersmith or something from you know, somebody who works with clay or whatever the pottery, whatever it is. They had skills that allowed them to have a steady income. Then there was another class, the peasants. They were the largest group of the population by far. They were the farmers. They were the day laborers. They were the people who struggled each day just to make enough so that they could take that and go home, or on the way home, buy something to eat and supply for their family. Day-to-day -day subsistence. At the very bottom, which you, you hear a little bit about in the days of Jesus, they were the outcast of society. This group is, is smaller than, than some of the others, but it, it was the group that sometimes could get bigger depending on diseases and sicknesses and whatever. They, they were labeled unclean because they were diseased. They were crippled. They were blind. And because of their physical issues, they were not allowed to work. They were not allowed to worship. They were unable to enter into the temple or to the synagogue because they had physical issues and they weren't allowed to do jobs. Well, this was before we're used to government helping those that are sick or diseased or crippled or maimed or whatever. They didn't have that. They depended solely on the charity of other people in order to survive. They begged if they could and were often seen in places where the rich would walk by for a better success in getting a charitable handout. 
find a good place. And so we have Peter and John on their way to the temple, and you know, some guy begs food, and they say, silver and gold we don't have, but such as we have we'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. You know, just situations like that, the, the Bible is full of. So with this background of the social classes, we can understand better what Jesus hears and Luke's readers would have immediately grasped, that the rich man was from the ruling elite, while Lazarus was part of the unclean outcast. They were at the polar opposites of their society. They rarely would meet except if the beggar was begging off of the rich person, and that was the only way. In fact, the rich people tried to insulate themselves away from the beggars of society. The rich man had the finest purple clothes. Purple was expensive, and so if you wore purple every day, you had a lot of money. He also had the most expensive fine linen undergarments. I read a lot about that. I won't go into the details, but it, it was just, it was top-notch underwear, as long, along with his top-notch outer clothes. And we don't think about that, but that's a pretty big deal for a number of reasons. Lazarus, what did he wear? The tattered rags of a beggar, which were not sufficient even to keep him warm at night. He had that one outfit. It didn't get washed, unless it rained. His body was covered with sores or ulcers that oozed, which made Lazarus unclean so that he would not be allowed to work a job or go to, into a place of worship. The rich man ate lavish meals every day, while Lazarus hoped to gather a few crumbs to stave off starvation. In Jesus' day, the cost for one pound of meat was the same cost of hiring 30 day laborers to work one day. So you can imagine this guy consuming, he and his family, meat when most people could not afford it. And instead of that one pound of meat, you could hire 50 or 30 people for the same cost. The extravagance of the wealthy could have fed many people a decent meal. It could have fed 30 people with one pound of meat as far as cost. But this man didn't care about the misery of others as long as he fared sumptuously every day lived the privileged life. He was calloused, he was hard-hearted toward the good man who was dying at his gate. And we found out from the end of the story that Lazarus was a good man. He had a relationship with God. He ended up in heaven. But he had no relationship as a rich man with that good man who was just afflicted by a disease which caused him to be unable to work and unable to worship. Now, in the picture here, we got to look at a little bit more. Normally, when a Jewish family would sit down to eat, they would sit down on the floor or ground if they were outside, or in some houses even the ground. And they didn't have tables, per se, but they would take their food and eat whatever they had. But when it came to the rich and the elite, and in the times of banquets or special occasions, because Jesus even did this at the Passover, the Jewish people had adopted the Roman style of eating, which was where you sat around a table in a U-shape, well, this upside-down U, and you would recline at that table, laying down, so the table is about head high, and, uh, but you would recline at an angle to the table so that you could reach up and get the things off the table. So if this was the table, you'd be kind of at an angle to it. So you're laying on your left elbow so you could read right, right hand. There was no lefties. 
Because everybody laid the same way. Otherwise, if somebody was this way, you'd be staring at each other, right? So they laid on their left side, and everybody ate with their right, and they kind of were at an angle, which is an interesting setup because if you were all sitting at an, or laying at an angle on these beds or couches all the way around, the server can walk down the middle of the U and can serve the drinks and the food and, and whatever and um, bring on the next course and et cetera. But with the angle, it made it so that a person's back of their head would be against the chest of the person in front of them. If you're all sitting on the left-hand side because of the angle. I, I was going to call a couple guys up and demonstrate, but I think you can get the picture. Which is why the Bible says that when at the Passover, John was leaning on Jesus' breast, what was it? He was next to Jesus, which was the prime location. So Jesus front, and then John's back, and then somebody else's, and then somebody else's, and, and in, in this row. So when, when you want to talk to Jesus, what do you do? You lean back. Hi, Jesus. And your head would be in his chest. So this is the picture that, that we're painting here um, as, as they're eating. And today, we use napkins to clean ourselves up when we slobber and whatever. And you can imagine laying down and eating, that there would probably be some of that, well, not being their society, they had a lot of bread, and one of the things they would do is just reach up there and grab a hunk of bread and chunk it under the table. So the bread became the napkin, the spittle and the drool and the grease and the, that was your napkin. You're learning a lot. This is history here. This is what you want to do. So I was thinking about this, Sam. The next time we enact the Lord's Supper, we got to do it legitimately here. Yeah. We got to lay, lay the guys out here. <laughs> So they would throw the bones or throw the leftovers or throw the napkin bread on the floor underneath the table. So after the meal is over, the cleanup crew, what do they do? They come along, clean up all these hunks of bread and drool and spittle and whatever else that was on them and dirt on the floor now. And they would scoop that up and put it in a bucket or something and carry it out and toss it on the trash heap by the back gate, and guess who's sitting at the back gate? This gives you a little more insight into what we're talking about, right? He wanted to eat the crumbs from the rich man's table, and he ended up eating what he could, but he was eating it off the trash heap outside the gate because that's... But you got to think about it this way. Better at the rich man's house than some of those poor people's house because they didn't throw out any scraps. They wiped their face and ate it. So it's a little bit different story. So he picked a good place. So this particular garbage dump was a good place for a beggar to get some scraps of food because there was more food thrown out of the rich man's house than any other house. But Lazarus had some companions while he was out there. Does anybody know who was there? Some of you read the scripture and you see that there was dogs there. Scavenger dogs. Now you know a scavenger dog is going to know the best place to go to get some scavenging. And so here's poor Lazarus, emaciated, he is weak, and whatever, and he's sitting out there and he's hoping that when they come and toss the scraps that he could get a few before the dogs. <laughs> you ever try to get a dog some food and get it away? Now dogs were rarely domesticated in biblical times. They were like other scavenger animals and were considered like that. In fact, the, the Jews called Gentiles dogs. It's kind of an interesting thing that, that flows into the stories of Jesus because uh, he dealt with one woman who was a Gentile and he talked about getting the scraps. He said, I'm not going to feed what's for the children to the dogs. She said, but yeah, but sometimes the dogs can get the scraps. 
Again, the same story that are thrown out. So Luke, being a doctor, find it very interesting in the, that the dog's saliva was used to heal some of the sores on Lazarus' body. While they are out there scrambling for the scraps, some of the dogs were nice enough to lick his sores. Luke would have been interested in that. He puts that detail in his account because he was a doctor. So the wild dogs were actually the closest thing that Lazarus had to nursing care. Think about that. There's one other interesting thing here, that Jesus said that Lazarus was laid at the rich man's gate. The word actually means thrown. He was thrown down. That kind of lets me know that Lazarus had come at one point asking, please, somebody give me some food. And the rich man had his servants take him out and throw him by the gate. Outside. Boom. They didn't care if he stayed or went. And that's where Lazarus lived. His companions were scavenger dogs. He's next to the garbage pile, ignored as much as possible by the rich man who no doubt used the front gate when he came and went. Now you can understand the contrast of this story being painted by Jesus. But the parable continued with another sharp contrast. And that was the contrast after death. And I spent a lot of time on hell last week, so we'll not spend much time on that today. But the contrast was that the rich man was in hell while Lazarus was in heaven. And there was a shocking, intentional twist that Jesus was making to this story. Why is this a twist? Because the Jewish people believed that those who were prosperous, those who had wealth, that was a sign of God's blessing. If you had prosperity, then you must be good with God. And God was blessing you. Your family was in with God. You were the priestly clan, or you were of the ruling group, or whatever the case. And you were blessed. And so God had made you prosper. That's why you were rich. After all, wasn't Abraham rich? And some of the others. And so they believe that the poor were being punished by God for their sinful lives and would probably end up in hell. So if you see a person with sores and you see a person who was begging and you see a person who, was, who couldn't work, who was crippled or blind, people would go around, which man sinned, this person or his parents? Remember that story in the Bible. So they automatically began to judge the person who was physically hurt and said there's got to be some sin in their life. So Jesus, in a big twist, paints a different picture. He says the man with a relationship with God is the beggar Lazarus who's out by the gate full of sores eating the slop and the crumbs. Whereas the rich man, who was supposed to have been prospered by God, ends up going to hell. You don't think that that took his people back. They were listening to this story. That was a big twist. Notice the subtle contrast. The rich man had a funeral. He was buried, it says. A lot of fine words, no doubt, were spoken. Expensive tomb, hired mourners, carrying on probably for a few weeks. They hired their mourning then. Where it said about Lazarus, he didn't even get a burial. He probably just ended up being kicked back behind the garbage pile somewhere. But it says that angels came and took Lazarus, took his spirit, and his new body, to Abraham's bosom. Now this is another word picture. Abraham's bosom. Remember how people reclined at the banquet table to eat? Well, Lazarus was given the spot right next to Abraham at the banquet table of heaven. And when he turned to talk with Abraham, his head would 
touch Abraham's chest. Since Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation, Lazarus in this picture that Jesus is painting was given the best place to eat at the banquet table of heaven right next to number one Jewish father addressed as Father Abraham here by the rich man. Where's Lazarus? Prime seat at the table, reclining with his head on Abraham's chest. So that pictures him being in paradise. But the people would have got the idea. He was there with Abraham. And as we continue the contrast, there are some hints in this story that begin to give us insight into what the sin of the rich man was. Why did he go to hell? The rich man made two requests from hell. The first was, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, verse 24, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. You catch the irony here. The rich man requested that Lazarus, whom he ignored in the regular life, had him thrown out to the back gate, He's now requesting that Lazarus become his servant in the afterlife. The man he had thrown out of his gate, whom he ignored, who he competed with the dogs for table scraps, who, by the way, is now eating his first good meal ever, let him leave his meal, come and minister to my needs. Dip the tip of your finger in water and cool my tongue. I ask you, did the rich man learn his lesson? Even while he's in hell, he's still thinking the same way. Notice his second request. Down later in verses 27, 28, he says, Abraham, I beg you, send him, Lazarus, to my five brothers to warn them so they won't come to this place of torment. I'm leaving some parts of it out, but that's basically what he's saying. He's still not getting it, even after the conversation's been carried on. He still was trying to order Lazarus around like his servant because he is down there and I'm up here. Even in hell, the mentality was still there. His only concern, too, is for his own family and friends. What about the others in this community who might end up in hell? In his mindset, the common person didn't matter. Those beneath him on the social scale only existed to serve the elite of which he was a part. Wow, wow, wow. With that in mind, let's move on to our third point, the main lesson. Jesus is giving some valuable insights into the existence of heaven and hell, that's for sure. But that's not the main point. The major truth of this parable was how the rich man sinned. He didn't commit a crime. He didn't break any of the Ten Commandments. Jesus didn't mention any of those things. He wasn't on the ten most wanted list for bad people in in his, his town. There was none of this that we could say about him. He was considered one of the good old boys of Jewish society by everyone, well spoken of. The main lesson is that the rich man committed a sin called selfishness. And self-centeredness. According to Old Testament theology, those in the Jewish society who were wealthy and had had a social responsibility to minister to the needy around them. You can look him up. This rich man was so selfish in character that he is depicted as doing nothing to alleviate the suffering of those in his town. Specifically, a very good man, if you just got to know him, a man who is closer to God than he was. He ignored Lazarus, dying at his own gate. But it went deeper than that, because ignoring a suffering, starving man is terrible. But a man was so self-absorbed that there was no room in his life for a relationship with God. That's sad. He has the problem of a lot of people. They think that they're automatic. 
because they're good people, basically. And society thinks they're good people. They don't know what happens at the back gate. All they see is what's happening at the front gate. And they see how he walks with his royal robes and, and his, uh, his entourage as they go through town. And, oh, buy me some of that meat over there. And give me some of that over there. And shoo shoo beggars. And if he said anything to anyone, he greet. Oh, he greeted me today. So he thought he was an automatic. Because of his richness, he didn't have time to humble himself. He didn't have time to seek God's leadership. He didn't have time to minister to God's family with his wealth. He has already in. He had made it, according to his society and their rules. I wonder if in his heart sometimes he didn't think or feel. But no, he was hard-hearted. He never allowed God to soften his heart through repentance. He never allowed God to share his compassion, his love with him. And if he had, God's love would have made him a compassionate man instead of a selfish, self-centered man. And let me insert here that Christianity is known for its compassion and known for the compassion of its people, modeling the love of Jesus. Where the gospel of Jesus has gone Good things have always followed, health and education and all kind of things. And I just want to brag a little bit about the Church of the Nazarene because I know a little bit about us. I, I know other denominations do this kind of stuff. But the Church of the Nazarene, we have over 50 colleges, I think it's 53, colleges and seminaries around the world teaching today over 50,000 students. 36 of those colleges and seminaries are for theological training. Our main emphasis in teaching is on learning the Bible, learning God's Word. You get other things with it, but that that is the biggest portion of them. We also have nurses training colleges and teaching training colleges, and we also have 14 liberal arts, two nurses training, one teaching. Our denomination supports over 700 full-time missionaries, as well as there's a whole host of thousands of volunteers who each year pay their way or get sponsors to help them pay their way so that they can do ministries. And I, I love it every month when I hear from Alyssa, who we help sponsor on her trip to Brazil, South America, and she's telling the stories of what God is doing through their lives. We help support her. Our denomination has 60 medical clinics and hospitals around the world. We are worried and have been about the mental and physical well-being of people in poor countries. 60 hospitals and clinics run by the Church of the Nazarene. You ought to be grateful. And thousands of compassionate ministry centers in the Church of the Nazarene, where a little village here or a little town there and et cetera, you can go and you may receive some food or may receive some clothing. You may be able to receive some, some assistance. They can help you fill out paperwork, maybe get some counseling, maybe help you with your uh, addictions. We have literally thousands of those. In fact, we're just opening one up right here on our district in southern Indiana. <laughs> It's going to be in Newberry, and it's opening up in September. We're going to have our own Compassionate Ministry Center right here. In fact, yesterday was a work day there, getting it ready for the opening, where they plan to do counseling. and That's pretty cool. And whenever there's a disaster that strikes around the world, guess who's there? You don't hear it. You see about the Red Cross or whatever. But Nazarene Compassionate Ministries sends a team. And we are there. And we help. 
and we pray, and we work with those people, and we hand out crisis care kits, which this church helps to fill every year. Aren't you glad? We are a part of something that's big and is doing something in compassion for the world. Of course, we're doing stuff for our school next door and for other things right around the area uh, that we are helping to support, the food pantry, crisis pregnancy center, etc. So while compassion is the norm for people following God, this man was anything, this rich man was anything but compassionate. So he claims to be a good person, claims to have a relationship with God, but he did not. His attitude was, I'll take care of my wants and those of my family and best friends, and I'll ignore the needy that God puts in my life to help. So he was selfish, he was self-centered, and that was his sin. That's what landed him in hell. And that was the main point of this parable Jesus was teaching. And it's so easy for us to hear the message last Sunday about going to hell and making sure that we don't go there. And then we begin to look at people around us who are, oh, that's a terrible sin, that's a terrible sin, they're going to go to hell, they're going to go to hell. But Jesus is talking about the person who thought he was religious, the person who everybody thought was okay with God, and he was the one that was going to hell because of his attitude. And so I couldn't let that go. Certainly we must be concerned for those that are out and out sinning. But it's almost easier to reach an out and out sinner than it is to reach a person who sits in church and goes to his synagogue and pays for the sacrifices and, and, and hangs out with the priest and all the other big shots in town who has a problem of sin in his heart. Isn't that serious? So how are we going to avoid hell? First, we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means we got to go to God in repentance and ask Him to forgive us of our attitudes that thinks we're better than someone else. We have a race issue today. We have a poverty issue today. We have an immigration issue today. But all of those issues would be resolved by the compassion and love of Jesus. If people would focus on a relationship with God, it's good preaching. But nobody wants to hear that. We're all about my rights and your wrongs. Jesus died for all. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. We need to ask God to forgive our sins and live in obedience to God's will for the rest of our lives and get rid of our stinking thinking and rotten attitudes. Second, we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That means tithing to your local church so our ministries can continue. That means giving offerings to world missions and to ministries outside of our church. But it's more than money. Loving your neighbor means sharing the gospel to those in your sphere of influence. It means following the leadership of God when he asks you to do something, to get involved in a ministry, to, to share the good news, to, to be a light and to be salt wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Love your neighbor. How can you love your neighbor when you don't even know his name and haven't even told him about Jesus? Jesus. 
That hurts. Getting awful quiet. And I'm not talking about just handing money out. It's more than that. Because when it comes to money in our modern society here in America, rarely should you hand out cash to people you do not know. Because too often today, cash goes to support addictions and wants instead of actual needs. So I'm not talking about that. Give them Jesus. They don't want to hear that. But find a way. It's always good to share the love of Jesus to everyone you can. John Wesley is known for some of his quotes. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. I ran across this one. He was given credit for this saying, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, but in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. He tried to live by that. And we all know of people who need God. Where is the compassion of Jesus to reach them? Do we really want any of them to end up in hell? So the great commandment, according to Jesus, is to love God and love other people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Selfishness is a sin because it breaks this great commandment. Self-centeredness was the sin that puts the rich man into hell. I can find no other reason why he was put there. But today, we are smarter than that. We're going to learn today, right? We're learning from this. That's the intent of Jesus teaching this parable. We are committed, and we will commit ourselves to a real relationship with God. Number one, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. And we're committing ourselves to loving those around us with the love of Jesus Christ. And that may not mean handing them cash. That means helping them get on their feet. And helping them to start making some smarter choices in their life. But that takes time. And time is one of those things that we don't like to give. But if you had the compassion, you can find some time, an hour a week, something to give in helping. There's many different places you can volunteer. Many organizations in our community run on volunteers. They fed 800, almost 800 children this summer every day. They traveled enough distance distributing that food to go to Anchorage, Alaska and back three times this summer, passing out food. Every day they meet and put it together. School starting, so then it would be just on the weekends. But that program was totally funded by compassionate giving. from people in our community, and compassionate volunteers. Just one idea of what people can do who care. So we're going to learn. We're going to do better. We're going to find a way of loving those around us with the love of Jesus. And so we have what we call family altar time here. But I want to ask a question. What has God been speaking to us about this morning? Some of you are focused on children. Some are focused on teens. Some may be focused on senior adults, ministering to them. The Lord's laid this on your heart. We have different areas and different giftedness, things we can do. You've done many of those kind of things. But it's God speaking to us today about some of our Selfish, self-centered attitudes. And if he is, we want to grow. Amen? 
We want to grow. It's easy to excuse selfishness by saying, that's just the way I am. And you know when you say it that way, who you're blaming? You're blaming God because he made me that way. You think God made you selfish? Well, that's just the way I am. But it is that very attitude that caused the rich man to spend eternity in hell. That's just the way I am. So the warning is real and vital for us to consider this morning. Someone here needs to ask God for forgiveness for a selfish attitude, robbing God of tithe, or robbing God of ministry time, robbing God of efforts. Someone needs to ask a spouse for forgiveness, or children, or parents, because of their self-centered. When we're self-centered, it affects our families. They know it. Cut off people. Someone needs to ask God for forgiving him or her because we tend to keep Jesus selfishly to ourselves instead of sharing God's love with sinners. When we have the greatest gift and we've experienced it to ourselves, if we're not sharing it with at least one person, Are we not being selfish? Think about it. If you struggle with minding God this morning, if God's been speaking to you this morning, and you struggle with minding God, isn't that an indicator of a self-centered attitude? I don't really want to mind you, God. I want to do it my way. When God speaks, we need to respond. When God puts a Lazarus at our doorstep, we shouldn't throw him to the gate and let the dogs take care of him. And it's probably not going to be so obvious as a Lazarus. It's probably going to be somebody at work All the time, Debbie can come home from work with a story about somebody who she works with or one of the residents. There's always somebody who needs love. Someone to listen. Someone to say, I pray for you. A lot of times it's just listening as they unload. Kind word, a touch, an attitude of caring. There are many reasons to pray this morning. I'm tying in a little bit with what Mary was saying. There's a God who loves you so much. Why don't we want all that God wants to give us? And the greatest joy you will ever have is sharing Jesus to someone else and see their face light up when they get it and when they get him praying with someone, and wow, the fire falls. Teaching someone, and the light bulb comes on. Loving someone, and later in the week they go, God used you to help me. Family altar time. Praise team's coming, but I want to ask a question. Who wants to change today? Who wants to make sure you're not going to hell because of your selfish attitude? Come and pray about all kind of things, but let's start with our selfishness and self-centeredness. I want to pray this morning, and I want you to join me.
because this is the reason the man went to hell, as far as I can tell. And it's a reason all of us would like to ignore. But it is the reality. It is the reality. Let's pray together. Stand and sing. Feel free to come on down, pray with those that are here. Just be a part of this attitude of prayer this morning. Oh God, it's your church. We're gathered here today and we're praying about attitudes. We're praying about needs. Speak to all of us, we pray. Help us to understand you're a God of love, a God of compassion. After all, you created us and breathed into us the breath of life, and we become living souls. And that God of compassion is calling to us, and we're responding with the song. We want to give more to you, Lord, more love to you, more love to Jesus. And how do we love you? We feed his sheep. We, we shepherd the sheep. Lord, I love you. I love you. Well, feed my sheep. And so, Lord, that's what we want to do today. We want to get involved. Finding tangible ways to support the kingdom of God. And grow the kingdom of God. And minister to people. And to meet needs. And we know it's a very sinful, wicked world, but we're going to do what we can. <laughs> To let Jesus shine through us. Let Jesus shine through us today. Let your light so shine that people will see the good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Be with these that are praying today. Fill them with a desire to seek God. Fill them with a desire to know Jesus. Fill them a desire, Lord, to have the love of Jesus. Just come fill them. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us, Lord, of our bad actions and our bad attitudes and our bad words, our bad habits, Lord. Clean us up, Lord. Change us. Make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. All things become new. So we confess today, Lord, we're sorry. We confess today, Lord, we're sinners. We confess today, Lord, that we're not good enough. But you make us good. Your love is every bit what we need. Your love is able. It's stronger. It's greater. It's bigger. It's deeper. Your grace, Lord, is sufficient. Your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. So we ask you into our hearts today again. And we ask you, Lord, to come in and fill us. We ask you, Lord, to make us somebody new. We ask you to change us. We ask you, Lord, to restore the joy of your salvation, creating us a clean heart, creating us a clean mind, creating us a clean body. Today is a new start, a fresh day, a new beginning. Old things passed away, all things become new. And may our family members say, wow, she's got a new attitude. Wow, he really loves me. We pray that the love of Jesus will just come flying in and out of our lives. Oh God, change us, we pray today. Lord, we pray for physical healing. But Lord, what we need is spiritual healing today. Heal us, Lord Jesus. Heal us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our community. We pray for our town. We pray for our county. We pray for healing, Lord. We pray for the children as they go back to school tomorrow. We just pray, Lord, for our church. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for compassionate ministry centers. We pray, oh God, for preachers and teachers. We pray, Lord, for people that go to the work world every day and face others that don't know Jesus. Help us to be missionaries to them, we pray. We pray for mothers who are trying to raise their children by themselves. We pray for dads who are trying to raise children. We pray for grandparents who are raising their children today. Lord, we pray that you will help us in our community, 
and in our homes and in this church to find something where God is at and get involved in it and do what God wants us to do. Thank you, Lord, for this message this morning speaking to me. And thank you, Lord, for those that are responding. And we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I lift my voice to as a follow-up to the message this morning. Think of someone right now who you know who's not a Christian that's in your sphere of influence and begin to pray for them starting today. That is selfless. That is giving. That is loving. And ask God somehow through this week to give you an opportunity to share Jesus with that person. Walk by with a loaf of bread or whatever you've got, you know. And why can't we just be Jesus to them in an unselfish way, just showing them that we love Jesus and we love them. And as the Lord leads you, work that relationship until there's a time when you can say, why am I doing this? Because God loves me and God loves through me to you. And then you can tell them about Jesus. That's where it starts, folks. We just say, well, I can't win anybody to Jesus Christ. You can love them to Jesus Christ. That was what Jesus did. And that's what we are to do. So I wanted to say that because I don't want everybody walking out here, well, the pastor says we got a selfish attitude. I don't know what to do about it. Do something. <laughs> Start today. Do something. And you can work yourself right out of that selfish attitude in a second by starting with prayer. And then start doing something with little feet and hands to it, right? And smile. The clerks at the Walmart need a smile. 
Instead of grumping and complaining, and your waitress needs a smile, and your aide or your worker, your janitor, your whatever that's at work, they need smiles and appreciation. And, and guess what? Even your spouse needs a smile after 35 years of marriage. <laughs> yes. How does this thing work? It works by working at it. Because if we're not careful, we'll become selfish. Even Debbie and I. We have to work at it all the time. Love. Love, love, love. Thank <laughs> you.